You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Welcome to the Lawyer Stories podcast with Benny Gold. Uh, Today we welcome back in Joshua Goldberg, fan favorite of Lawyer Stories, and also personal injury lawyer serving all of Ontario. How are you doing? I'm very good. I'm uh, very, very good, I have to say. The the sun is shining. Um, You know, business is good. Life is good. No complaints on my end. I love that. Nothing would, of course. I love that. There's so many complaints out there that it's so nice and, <laughs> and refreshing to hear somebody say, I'm doing good, can't complain. Um, you know, I try and have an optimistic uh, way of looking at life, but uh, my spouse, unfortunately, has the opposite. So oh, keep okay. that, hopefully that won't end up in the podcast. <laughs> Josh, that, that sounds like another podcast for another time. <laughs> and hey, we're here to hear it all. But uh, let's focus on, on the legal stuff. Sure. Um, so looking forward to catching up. So Josh, you were in episode 45. Um, this is probably going to land, I think probably after a hundred. Um, oh, wow. so, yeah, so that's, that's amazing. Kind of, Muzzle talk to you, Benny. Thank you very much. And by the way, when we did 45, we were in a different room and I had a different backdrop. So welcome into lawyer stories HQ. Very nice. So I very hope nice. I like the clock. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Um, so in the past, we discussed, uh, you grew up in Montreal, you travel, you told me how, uh, you traveled like Asia, Australia, Africa, like before you went to law school. But one thing I wanted to ask, and I, you know, I might've asked this in the first episode, but I definitely need a refresher. Like first tell us where you traveled and what the highlight was. Oh my God, where to start? So I'll try and give you like an overview rather than like listing country by country, because that'll take an hour. But um, so my I first started in Taiwan. I was there for about a year, came back, finished my degree. Um, then I went to Southeast Asia for about six months. I was in like, you know, like all over the, the map for the month. You know, like there's a kind of trail that you know a lot of people take from like Thailand to Laos to Vietnam to Cambodia or some some order similar to that Um, then we went up to uh, China moved around a lot in China for about a year and a half then to uh, Xinjiang which is Chinese Turkestan like the the second Tibet as some people are are, you know are calling it Um, it doesn't have the same publicity as Tibet sadly but same situation going on there um, and then we went to Tibet, and then we made our way from Tibet down to Nepal, into India, and then from India I went back to China to study Chinese again, and then I wow. went to Australia for about a year and a half with my spouse, because um, that's where he was studying at the time. And um, from there, I made my way back for law school. I did my LSATs actually. In, so, so in before you get into law school, I, I want to ask, like, what was the defining moment? Was there a moment? Maybe it wasn't something, you know, like that, but that you said to yourself, "I'm going to law school." Yeah. Uh, so I guess you know, again, I think I mentioned this last time, but I've yep. always been one of those dorky kids who just nice. love law. Like, I've always found it so fascinating. Like the minutia, just you know, no matter what people talk about, except for maybe like you know, philosophically, um, it it always has interested me. And, you know, when I was a kid, like, instead of watching cartoons or, I don't know, like, what's Saved by the Bell? Is that what was popular when I was a kid? I don't know. Instead of watching that kind of shit, I was was addicted to Law & Order. Like, I would watch it, like, as as many times in a day as possible and, like, study, like, you know, every aspect of it. I just always loved the law. Right. My um, my interest in like what field has waned. You know, at one point I wanted to be a criminal lawyer, which God forbid, thank God I'm not. I don't think I'd enjoy the lifestyle. Then I wanted to be an international human rights lawyer. 
also didn't uh, really pan out. And then I took an insurance law course and was surprised to find that it was like the most interesting really aging course I ever taken by the most okay. amazing professor who she probably won't hear this, but I just want to give a shout out to Elizabeth Quigley. And um, I forget her firm name. I think it's Obaji Connolly and she still practices. What, she's what's her she's last name? Most... Quigley? Quigley? Quigley. Quigley. Elizabeth Quigley. And like with a G? Honestly... With a, is that with a Q or like a Quigley? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's like Q-U-I-G-L-E-Y maybe? Got you. All right. Uh, she probably won't remember me because it was a large class. Um, you know, although I was one of those keener students who always had their hand up, but, um, yeah, like she, I, I, I totally 100% uh, give her credit for my decision to go into, um, insurance, even though I, you know, we call it on the personal injury side, personal injury, um, you know, the insurance side, the defense side is, is called insurance and it's really all insurance law. Just, you don't say that for the plaintiff lawyer. So, um, right. So anyways, insurance law was just, you know, like the, the thing that really like made me excited about law, <laughs> bizarrely. No, that's, no, that's that's cool. Like, I think the international human rights thing that you mentioned, I think, you know, a lot of people go to school and they're like, oh, like this would be so cool. But it's like, I don't know the practicality. Like it's, it's probably really hard to get into something like that. Um, sort of like honestly... civil rights law, you know, it, you can do it, but it might not be the cases that you're looking for all the time. Although everybody's civil rights are important, right? So. Yeah, I honestly, you know, like I, I did a semester in China when I was uh, studying. Um, and to be honest, like my goal was to try and do some human rights law, which didn't really pan out. I ended up doing some like Chinese corporate law at a, law, at a big Chinese law wow. firm, um, which didn't really do it for me. The firm was lovely, but yeah, I just didn't really love the work. It's a lot of like due diligence. Um, and then I, you know, it just, it just never materialized the, the human rights. Like, I, I guess it's also not an easy field, I think, to get into. I think you have to really network and, and be a political uh, savvy person and like know people in politics to really yeah. move in that area because it's just not, it, it's not straightforward, just law, um, you know, like, international politics and international relations is a big part of it so i you know during law school especially i was not a much of a networker so yeah I, um yeah anyway so so, by the so, way, so, I, so why so you're in so why personal injury i mean i know you said you liked insurance law but what was the draw i i just found it really interesting it's like you know just to give you a, a really dorky maybe strange example um one of my favorite things is like I don't know if you remember from law school uh, or from the, doing the LSAT logic games. Yep. You know where if X is Y and B is whatever and you sure do, things. sure do. Yeah. So a lot of most people I know hated that part. That type of work really, really gets me. Like I, I just love it. I find it fascinating, and it, it's it's kind of like a you know like a, a real life jigsaw puzzle. Um, and, you know, I, I found the work in insurance uh, or personal injury similar to that, you know, like there's a lot of Interesting. trying to, you know, you've got like the kind of border of the puzzle with like the, the rules and, you know, the rules of civil procedure and, and the laws, and then you have to figure out how to put the puzzle together. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways to do that. And it's fun figuring that out and your problem. That's, so would you say uh, a lot of your cases settle or a lot of them go to court? In Ontario, I think the stats are like 1% go to trial. Oh, okay. Although they did. So recently, um, the Ontario court um, made a just fantastic, like one of the best um, decisions, I, you know, I, I've been alive or around to um, hear about. They changed Interesting. Um, the simplified. So I guess just to kind of back up a sec. So you know, Ontario used to be you had a, you know, you had three ways of suing. You have small claims court, which was like if you're suing for 25000 or less, which, you know, most most personal injury claims, you don't want to max out at 25000 It doesn't give you a lot of room to negotiate and you never know how much, you know, a case is worth because they're so subjective in, these, in this industry. Then there was simplified, which was only a hundred grand. And there were some limitations, but, you know, you could still, you could still have a jury and um, you know, it, it wasn't that advantageous to sue and simplify. And then you have like superior court where you can sue for, you know, like one, two, three million, whatever you want to sue for above a hundred thousand. Nice. 
Um, and you can, you know, in simplify, oh, sorry, in, in regular superior court, you could always uh, file a jury notice. And you know, one thing about juries in Ontario is um, they are often not properly informed by law about the rules in Ontario uh, when it comes to um, these cases. So, you know, a lot of personal injuries, there, there's some, there's some, some areas like medical malpractice I've heard is better with juries, but, you know, car accidents and premises liability cases tend to be better with a judge alone trial. And what the change that they made, sorry to kind of take a while to get around to, to getting to this point, um, the change that the, the courts made was they increased the amount available to sue under Simplify to 200,000, okay. and they made it that you cannot have a jury. So these are judge alone trials. It simplifies things greatly and makes um, you know, the case a lot more straightforward. A lot of insurance companies, knowing that they have a lot of loopholes in Ontario that they can exploit, especially in, in a jury trial, um, you know, lose a lot of ground, in my opinion, with, with uh, you know, a judge alone trial. So um, I think there's going to be a lot more. Did, did you write a blog post? I know you're doing a lot of cool stuff on LinkedIn. I hope everybody will check you out on LinkedIn. I noticed a lot of blogs and that sort of things. And by the way, we'd love to put some of those on our uh, website and link back to you. Oh, yeah, like, absolutely. Or you could link that. back to you could link back to us that I think that's like a big thing. I'm learning a little bit here and there about like SEO and all, but yeah, and it, exactly. we could, we could talk about that offline, but yeah. um, have you written about that? That seems like a pretty um, important issue. I think I wrote about it. So I've written so many blog posts since I opened, like initially I was doing my own social media. I recently hired this great team of, um, of you know, social media professionals to, to run it, but yeah. Originally, I was doing all my own blog posts, and I'm pretty sure early on I did a post explaining yeah. the differences between, you know, suing in simplified, suing in small claims, suing in, you know, regular, simple, uh, superior court. And let me give you, give them a shout out. They're very nice. Uh, they did a great job. They're really approachable. I met with them because I, you know, I was interested in what they were doing. And so shout out to them. Uh, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I can't so, remember. I know their names, but I can't remember the name of their their company to to shout LC, out. Yeah, for. the social creatives, and it's uh, and so yeah, you could look it up if you want. So um, what? It, give me some advice for young lawyers, Josh. Uh, what's my best advice? So, I think the best advice that I could probably give is try and you know like get into a firm and, and start trying to practice like even you know whether it is as a summer student as a part-time job as early as possible because I, you know i have a lot of i have a lot of friends who you know let me start you know kind of at, at the beginning about how it works with and i'm sure it's similar in the states but when it comes to articling um for your american you know, people, the Americans watching this articling is, is a 10 month internship where you, you work under a lawyer as essentially a kind of articling student or a law student. And it's a requirement to become a lawyer in Ontario in addition to writing the bar exam. So, um, you know, in Ontario, a lot of people have a tendency to go wherever they get a job. And, you know, getting a job is often, you know, a lot of factors, it's not always about you know, the type of law, like people don't know. So they, they go wherever they, you know, if they interview well at a, at a firm, they have lots of choices. They'll go with a firm that, you know, seems the nicest, but that doesn't mean they're going to love the area of law. So um, back to my suggestion, you know, a lot of people get into law and they get stuck in a field that they don't enjoy. So the earlier you can try, you know, kind of like testing the waters in different practice areas, the sooner you'll have an idea of what you actually like. And, you know, I, I think, I, I wish I had known sooner. Like it took me a good, like it was almost the end of law school before I realized what I wanted to do. To that, that's not a long time, Josh. A lot of people uh, go on and on after law school and still, you know, can't figure out what type of law they want to practice, but good for you. I mean, that's, you know, that seems like that you was, really were trying to figure out. I think a lot of people don't know that they should. I mean, I don't know. They're not encouraged to try to figure it out. Well, especially, you know, I find career services in, in at least the, the school that I went to for the longest, U of O. I did a year at U of T as well, but 
Um, I, I spent most of my time at U of Ottawa Law School and unfortunately career services, at least when I was there, was really focused mostly on um, the large Bay Street firms. Bay Street is our, uh, what do you call it? Wall Street. So gotcha. you know, like the Bay Street firms are, you know, all the big. Well, right, we, I get it. I get it. Seven Sisters. You know, so all the really big firms, and they tend to focus on those, and um, and it, it's a very, very different recruitment process, and just the, the entire situation is just so different from what you experience when you're, you know, looking at, at jobs in, you know, boutique firms that only practice one area of law and that are smaller. So, you know, the, I found I didn't have a lot of support when I was, you know, trying to figure out what to do. You know, I, I originally wanted to go to a Bay Street job because everybody's kind of brainwashed in the first year or two that you know like that's where you want to be. You want to be at like one of these big firms because they pay a lot and it's prestigious. Um you know and, and then for the people who want to go elsewhere it's it's just slim pickings in terms of the yeah. information that you get. Right and and they don't help you at all. I totally believe me, I totally get that. Um so like how how is uh how has your firm changed since we last spoke? Um, I guess we've just kind of progressed. You know, like when I when when I made the firm, my spouse is actually a CMA, so I had the benefit of having, you know, a financial planner essentially sit down with me, go through all the the potential numbers and the you know like the you know the plan in terms of you know like how many cases I have, hope to have when and what kind of income I hope to have by what point, you know, and and do a really thorough, really good plan. Um, and we, you know, like we managed to really like exceed the target, like every wow. target. Wow. So, you know, like we started with one case literally and now, you know, a year and I guess we're almost at two years in November, it'll be two years, you know, we'll, we'll have about 200 clients. Plus I have another, you know, firm that sends me a lot of work. Um, you know, we're very busy. Things are going really well. I hired, um, you know, an extra staff member because we just have too much work on our hands. I'm right. looking at hiring a student and, uh, you know, and a junior lawyer. I have one who's working just kind of part-time freelance, but um, we're growing and it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Like it, it's kind of a stereotype to call the firm my baby, but. No, no, that's, that's awesome. My dogs and, and this next to my dogs. Ma mazel to you. Mazel tov to you. That's great. And I get it. The firm is your baby. You grew it. You, you've uh, nurtured it. You fostered it. That's, that's awesome. I'm so glad to hear how well you're doing. And honest, and I bet you're probably like a really great boss to work, to Thank work you. with. You're probably like, a I can tell, you know, everybody probably needs a mentor like Joshua mm -hmm. Goldberg, right? Like I could see you being that's like kind of you helping <laughs> people along. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But, um, yeah, anyways, it's, it's uh, things have gone well, and I, you know, I never thought I'd enjoy it as much as I did. And you know, right now we're trying to work on kind of building the firm in, in you know, like more from an SEO perspective. Like for the first like year, yeah. I, I was kind of lightly doing the SEO building on my own, and it's very hard. Like you know, if you, you don't have any experience, so that's why I hired the social media team. That's great. That's and, great. Uh, and yeah, no, it's it's been really good. I, I love I love working for myself, and I love yeah. So I was gonna. What's your favorite uh, part about being a lawyer and practicing right now? Um, I love just, I love getting on my feet in courts. Unfortunately, you know nowadays you don't, especially in this industry, you don't necessarily get to get on your feet in court as often as I would like. Um, the second favorite thing is you know telling a client. Um, that they're you know getting some like you know fair compensation. It's you know the reaction is always uh, just really really positive. A lot of my clients come from you know underprivileged backgrounds, and you yeah. know they, they work like you know minimum wage jobs sometimes, and are not you know very wealthy. And then you know to hear that all all the pain and suffering they went through was was not for nothing, and that they're getting this this you know check to compensate them like just the the reaction and the look on their face like makes you know what I do worth that's it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what advice would you give to somebody who's starting their own law firm? Planning, planning, planning. Um yep. you know, I I would say I would give so one of the things I did that I didn't even realize I was doing it until uh you know until I, I was ready to open my firm was I I was I, you know my my kind of 
practice personality is I'm just very nice and accommodating to everybody. I, yep. I try and treat everybody with like a lot of respect. And I like, you know, I like, you know, I, I talk to a lot of adjusters. I get to know them. Uh, defense lawyers, same thing. Like I'm always like easy to work with and pragmatic whatnot. And just, and doing favors, being kind, it goes a long way. And you don't even realize that it's networking when you're doing it, but eventually you know like when you do if you if you're just kind for the sake of being kind to a lot of people eventually when you do need a favor people will be happy to help um and that's, that's, that's kind of what happened with yeah. me like I, I, I was just you know for the 10 years of practice before i opened my own firm i was just you know like i don't want to sound like i'm blowing my own horn too much but you know, like i was just very nice like defense lawyers like from what i've heard i've got a very good reputation with you know the defense and uh, the defense community and insurance companies so um people were were just happy to help me you know like uh, another the same with other lawyers like anybody i know who has a client like so, they're happy to refer to me and so you don't necessarily have to take an insurance uh company and like go like this around their neck to get like a good settlement yeah. for your client not necessarily okay. all right there are all some right. that you do unfortunately you know the laws in ontario are a little um, let's say unfair you know i won't get into it because it, it's a bit technical and boring but there are lots of restrictions on claiming compensation for pain and suffering for example if you're in a car accident and uh you know some insurers are just very aggressive you know unless you have an objective a serious objective injury you know there, there are a few insurance companies that just refuse to pay a dollar even. right um, you know, they just will not pay. They'll force the case to trial. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but, you know, I think most people in my industry know which, which companies I'm talking about. Okay. So, but for the most part, yeah, like I, I work with a lot of adjusters and, you know, they, they have to close their files too eventually. And, you know, they're, they're willing to talk Turkey and we don't, you know, like you said, I don't have to wring anybody's neck to get it done. Talk Turkey. I like that. <laughs> is that a, is that a canadian expression and, I, was, I mean i, I haven't heard just, in like a while it's, but it's kind of cool will yeah. i think i'm gonna like make that our caption or something for our podcast when we post it talking turkey. find that's the cool. find the insurance company that's willing to talk turkey no <laughs> no that's awesome so um what what's your advice for somebody who's been injured in an accident like what should they do I guess a few things. I mean, number one, don't wait. So I have a lot of clients who find me after, you know, like, especially with premises liability accidents, which is where, you know, like a slip and fall, a trip and fall. A lot of people don't realize that they may have a case. And sometimes people you know, seriously injure themselves. You know, I've had clients who had, you know, like major fractures, you know, comminuted fractures where, you know, like their ankle was shattered and like pretty much detached from wow. their life. And they didn't think of, you know, opening a claim. They didn't think they had any case because, you know, they, they fell on the street or at a building and, you know, like they, they had no idea it could be somebody else's fault. Um, so, you know, my advice is you're in an accident and you think there's even a 1% chance of a claim, consult a lawyer. Just pick yeah. up the phone. Yeah. The worst thing yep. you'll hear is no. Right. Okay? Like, and it's, it, it won't cost you any money just to get a, you know, a brief assessment. Um, you know, and, and the second thing is just, I have a lot of clients as well who soft tissue injuries are, you know, like chronic pain and, you know, yep. nothing objective. Like that's one of the more common types of, of claims we get. And a lot of these clients, like, you know, unfortunately they, they know that family doctors and, and whatnot aren't able to do a whole lot for them in terms of treatment, you know, like chronic pain is very, very hard to treat condition you know i think most doctors have found ways of controlling it like with pain medication and whatnot but there's no cure for it and you know a yeah. lot of clients are just kind of ready to give up and just suck it up and live with it but insurance companies you know they, they base a lot of what a, a lot of these cases on what kind of medical documentation there is. so okay you know, it's important that they see doctors and get medical treatment um you know otherwise it, you know they'll, they'll they may be shit out of luck later. Wow. Yeah, no, totally. I think that's really good uh, advice for anyone to know. Um, so who would you say your biggest mentor is, Josh? 
Um, so one of my biggest mentors, his name is David Burstein. I still, you know, I'm still in touch with him regularly. He's a great guy. He was a trial lawyer who was hired at uh, my first, the first firm I worked at an article that. Um, just a really bright, incredible lawyer who just, you know, you could give him the most complex case and he could just pick it apart and, you know, become an expert in whatever the, the details of the case are. And he's just, you know, I, I learned so much from him about how to really analyze and, you know, kind of build a case. At the same time, you know, like when I was, when he was my mentor, I had the law firm I worked at actually had uh, three, three principal lawyers. So there was him, David, and then there was two other senior lawyers I worked with. And they each, all three of them had their own very, very different style. Like, you know, David, like I said, was the kind of like very analytical, very precise, you know, detail oriented lawyer um, who taught me how to like prepare for trial and, and really analyze things. And then one of the other lawyers was uh, kind of more about wheeling and dealing and just trying to like, you know, like schmooze and get things settled. And, you know, I learned a lot about, you know, how to do that from him. And then the other lawyer was just more pragmatic and kind of had a, had a really practical way of, look, of looking at every case and just kind of like getting to the heart and just trying to, you know, like close, you know, close the file out and deal with the issues that are at hand. So I guess awesome. all like together, I learned a lot from all three and I, I try to combine the knowledge. Yeah, interesting. It, Synthesize you know, it. It's all together in, in every case. And it just, I think it's, you know, having three completely different mentors really helped a lot in terms of making you the lawyer. I that's awesome. I think a mentor is so important. And, you know, that's why I think that mm -hmm. you'd be like a top mentor. I could tell just by your disposition. That's really, very kind of you. Really, Sadly, you know, a lot of firms don't give a lot of mentorship. Yeah. Especially smaller firms, you know, they hire students because they just need the help. Yeah. Don't have patience. Like an article of student requires a lot of patience because yeah. they come in knowing virtually nothing, especially, you know, about the practice area you're in. Yep. And, you know, you, you really have to sit down with them and make time to you know, explain things to them, like, right, like, you know, you have to, it's, it's kind of like you have mini lectures, where you're explaining, like, what they're doing, because it's not enough just to tell them how to do things, right, like, you're not doing your job, if you're just, you know, explaining how to do, do it without giving them the explanation of why they're doing it, right, uh, yeah, no, it, it makes total sense, I, I understand, so. I am just going to give my dog some treats before they start hounding me, okay, so, so do you have, so we're going to probably wrap things up, Josh. So do you have okay, any sure. final advice for the lawyer storage community? Uh, do you want to that, or do you want to tell us like where you hope to see your firm in five years? Um, I guess, uh, what, am I, what do I prefer to talk about? Um, I guess, what we, uh, you know, in terms of where I see my firm, I, I, I definitely, you know, the, the idea of having a large firm with, you know, like 20 lawyers is not appealing to me because of the stress of having 20 different teams all being, all needing to build. Like I find, yeah, you know, like my old firm had a you know, similar situation, like 20 different teams all had to, you know, like make money in order for the firm to survive. And I don't know how my boss managed the stress of knowing that, you know, like that's, you know, every team is going to have their own problems and you know what if like half the teams don't you know right. do well so you know my my goal is really to have a, a maintain a boutique style that's great firm, but i'd like to grow like i'd like to have one other senior lawyer and a junior yeah. lawyer helping um you know an article and student and, and probably some more support staff and uh you know just get bigger and better i'm planning on opening some satellite offices around wow. ontario that's awesome um, i also you know i, I think from last time you're aware that I speak Chinese and yep. I haven't really had a chance to kind of get into that Chinese community and you know advertise my services as a uniquely Chinese speaking Jewish white man um, <laughs> so I I you know like that's definitely something I'm aiming that's, hey we all gotta there's got to be a niche for it, right we all gotta find it exactly and you know like I I lived in China for a long time so I understand Chinese people and you know where they're yeah. coming from, so I think I'd I'd be a good match. But it's hard to break into different communities, right? right. Especially like you know, 
there's a lot of different ways you can get files in this business and it, it can be hard when you first start to kind of get people to trust you and you know send you work so for sure uh josh goldberg always a pleasure we could do it Thank again you. we could pick up again and uh you know i can't wait to see like how far you've come again in another year thanks so much ben as always, huge pleasure speaking with you. And um, thank you. you know, if you're ever in Toronto, let me know. Let's Absolutely. have a coffee or dinner. That'd be great. And, um, if I'm ever in your, your neck of the woods, I'll, I'll look you up as well. Please do. And uh, everybody out there, thanks for tuning in. Josh, stay right there. Wherever you are in the world today, enjoy yourselves. Cheers. Cheers.